Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our day one presentation for the uh, Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, second draw, second stimulus uh, package that the government has recently approved. Uh, today, uh, we are going to have some special guests present to, uh, with us. Uh, we have uh, Ms. Rosana Gomez and Mr. Halbert Brown from the uh, UTSA um, Minority Business Development Agency uh, COVID-19 Resilience Center located in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, this great partnership that we put together over the last few months has really helped us uh, provide resources and tools to our Laredo region and small business community. And I just wanted to remind everybody that today is day one. We have additional two presentations coming up on Tuesday and Thursday. So if you have not registered, please do so. Uh, today we'll be doing an overview of the Paycheck Protection Program, talking a little bit about uh, what happened in 2020, what uh, some of the changes that uh, have come about in 2021, and answer any questions that you may have. Uh, so let's kick it off. I'm going to pass it over to Rosana. She's going to talk a little bit about the MBDA, and then we'll pass it over to Mr. Halbert. Uh, Rosana, take it away. Thank you so much, Cesar. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. We know that sometimes, like, and obviously in this time of the year, people are very um, trying to get some information about what's going on in our community, what's going on about this type of information about access to capital. So before to go to the main topic today, I would like to share with you for those that don't know about the MBDA COVID-19 Business Resilience Center. My name is Roxana Gomez. I'm a senior business um, specialist um, at the center. I have been here for about six, seven months. It's actually the time since we opened the center and we are under the funds of the US Department of Commerce. That's why we are trying to look and find this type of collaboration with other organizations that want to help small businesses like you I know that you are here today because you want to get some important information about the PPP uh, second round that we are receiving uh, from the government. And I think it's very, very important that you keep uh, very, trying to be very connected with this type of information that is going to help you to apply to your, um, to your loan, to your PPP uh, loan. So I know that probably you don't know about the, the ABDA COVID-19 Business Resilience Center, but what we are here is because we want to help you. We want to help the small businesses uh, with different information. We can say educational or informative information that is going to help you, especially in this time where we all are probably struggling because the COVID-19 Business Resilience Center. So if you want to get more information about our center, we are going to provide you our email addresses where you can just contact us. We normally provide information about access to capital, access to new markets, social media strategies. We have a couple of things where we can help you and we can set up those like a one-to-one -one virtual meetings to give you that mentoring and that advising. So I don't want to take more of the time because we are going to cover many things of the PPP. So I'm going to pass the microphone to my coworker, Halbert, and I'm pretty sure you are going to enjoy this uh, webinar. Well, thank you very much, Roxana. Thank you, Cesar and Luis for getting all the technical stuff going for us this morning. However, of course, I had a little bit <laughs> technical issues with my own computers, but we worked through it. I always have a backup plan, as I say. I want to share the screen with you if I'm able to do so, because I do have a, a short presentation that I put together just so, for this reason. Now, I won't be able to see any questions or anything like that. So if you have questions, put them in chat and Ms. Roxana and Cesar will be looking at them. They can answer whatever technical questions you might have. Some of it we might defer to the Small Business Administration because we're not the experts. They work directly with these programs on a day in and day out basis. But what we wanna do is provide some basic information to make sure that everybody understands at least a little bit about the program, where we were in 2020 and where we are now in 2021. 
And as we go forward with the next few days, we'll talk about the application process on tomorrow. And then on Thursday, we'll talk about any tax implications and not a lot of tax implications with this money, but we'll just discuss some of the concerns that people might have and open it up for discussion and, and go from there. But I wanna thank uh, Roxana and Cesar and Luis for, for making sure that we're able to get this program off and running. They work very well together and I have to echo the same sentiments. This has been a great partnership. We've been able to put together several programs together right now. So I appreciate that, appreciate the willingness to work with someone that's not necessarily in that area, but by this method, we are in that area. So we can help you any any one-on-one -on -one that we may have to do. Of course, that's Miss Roxana and, and, and that's me. <laughs> And uh, if you want, you'll get this presentation. You can read a little bit about Ms. Roxana. She's a very talented young lady and a very good, a very good business advisor. So I wasn't going to go through her entire bio, but she's very talented. So if, you, if you're looking for a good business advisor, she'd be a, a good resource. And, uh, and I'm uh, so and, sorry. And I'm so sorry, Hal, that I didn't uh, provide you like a short. Um, oh, well, bio good. about me, but thank you, thank you for providing. That's quite that all right. We're we're good to go. I'm I'm good to go, and and that's mine. We'll we have we have mine. If you want to take a look at the little bitty things I've done over the time, and you you'll have all this info because we will share this information with you. Today we'll talk about PPP, but as customary, we have to have this disclaimer. You know, with this is not this is only advice, but this is not advice, legal advice or anything like that. I'm not a CPA, I'm a business degree person and a college professor. So I can look at things and, and give the basic information on it. But the US Treasury has regulations looking at Circular 230 that come into play. And when it comes to PPP, we're not trying to give you technical guidance on that. Please seek the Small Business Administration and the bankers that are out there providing these, these products and, and, the, and the funding for the PPP program. So I'll just jump right in. When we're talk, looking at the PPP program today, what we wanna do is just talk about the Paycheck Protection Program. That's what it is, the Paycheck Protection Program. It's a flexibility act. It's, we're talking about, we'll talk a little bit about forgiveness. We're, we're, over time, we'll cover these applications here and that's mostly tomorrow. We'll deep dive into those applications a little bit. We're not gonna go line by every line on it, but we'll discuss some of the nuances between the three documents that, that come into play. The purpose of the program, we do wanna talk about that. Basically in March, back January, February timeframe when COVID-19 hit us in the United States, finally, they, they made the decision at the national level to try to go home, stay home, and let's, let's, let's try to see if we can beat the coronavirus that way. When you do that, we have all these businesses in the United States, all these small businesses that operate to keep us supplied with food and, and, and whatever other supplies we might need in our households and even in our businesses. Well, if everybody goes home, that's gonna hurt the business. So the federal government decided through the oh. Department of Treasury and the Small Business Administration to put some money into the system to at least keep some of these people working because unemployment exploded when that happened it, because people started laying people off. And, and I mean, it was a nightmare. I'm sure most of you probably experienced it and then none of us probably want to relive it as it is or as it was then. But they put March 27th, they decided that we'll put some money into this, into the communities for small businesses. And as just about anything else, when you try to rush something out there, we might not do it exactly as advertised or we might not do it as good as we wanted to do it. So there's been quite a few iterations of the PPP program since then. One in particular was June 5th. They came out with another law, the PPP Flexibility Act. Senate decided to bring that on, which added some more money because in the first series, the some it seemed that some of the bigger corporations were getting some really big loans and it was extracting the money out of the system very quickly. 
and they put a little extra funding out there and tried to get it into the, the smaller community banks and the CDFIs and, and the minority banks and things like that to try to get it into the hands of minority business owners to get some of that money out there. And over time, some of it did get out there to the tune of about $133 billion or something, $133 million or something like that got into small business hands. So it, the, the program worked as advertised. It just had to have some tweaks here and there. The first program closed for applications on August the 8th. And the Small Business Administration at that time was no longer accepting applications. What they were trying to do is get the re remaining money that they had on the books in the federal, in the Treasury Department, trying to get that money into the hands of small businesses. And of course, the small businesses at that time had a chance to do eight or 24 weeks, eight weeks beforehand, before the June 5th, and then 24 weeks afterwards. But then there was some opportunities for the business owners and the banks to talk and they could change their programs or at least extend it out because initially it was good for for two years and you got to pay the money back but you could you could just put it off for 10 months then when june 5th came you could you could have extend it out to five years and with talking to the banks and SBA and all that, you can extend it out to five years if you got it beforehand, but it takes a lot of documentation and communication with the SBA and your banks. So the timeline that we're looking at when it comes to PPP funding, as you can see, March 27th was an important day because that's when it was passed into law. The 31st, they, they sent out some general guidance and then at that time they were working on the actual rule that was going to take place and it's called the interim final rules. You can find the IFR on the SBA website at sba.gov. A lot of this info that I'm telling you now, if you go to sba.gov, you can dive deep into the program. And I can tell you, I've read that interim final rule. It is not exciting. <laughs> it's in fact, in fact, I was trying to stay awake as I was reading it. Uh, you know, they, they put the legal jargon in there and then a lot of it is repeated. A lot of the information is repeated, but they did finally come out with an interim final rule. And you'll hear if you go to some of the, some of the SBA type presentations, you'll hear them talking about the IFR quite a bit because each time they do an iteration of this, they have to do an iteration of the IFR as well. Then of course, on June, 20, June 5th or June 4th, like I said, the Senate passed its bill and June 5th, it got out to us and everything. And then June 25th, the SBA clarified some more of the IFR. I told you it just keeps changing. And then July 4th, PPP extension was signed into law and that took it all the way out to August and they stopped everything then, but they extended the deadline to December 31st, 2020. And at that time, the program effectively had stopped as far as getting money into the hands of small businesses, except for the, the loans that were in progress that they had the, the funds allocated for it and all of that type stuff. When it comes to the spending rules though, now we have to look at for a small business what do you have to do once you get that money in your hand? Well, number one, you can't just start you know, when here's here's some of the, the myths. A lot of people out there got this money and they decided to lay off their people or fire their people. Then they go out and get their, their favorite car that they've been dreaming about for that forever. Or they go out and buy some condominiums and, and, and just go hang out on the beach. Well, truthfully, there was some of that but not on a grand scale because this stuff is audited. These businesses are audited. And if it's loans exceeding $250,000, oh, I'm sorry, exceeding $150,000, they were going to be looked at more closely anyway. But there was a little bit of that. Some people did let some people go and reduce payroll and uh, cut down the hourly pay and, and salaried pay and all that stuff. Some of them did that, but that puts you in another category because when it comes to forgiveness, if you did that, then you're not going to be qualified for all of the forgiveness at 100% like some of the other companies might be. So the bars are required to spend at least, it started out at 75% and 25 on other things, but then they reduced it to 60% 
of the loan proceeds have to be spent on payroll costs and other things. And then 40% uh, dealing with any other business type items. The maturity, I talked about that is five years now. Originally it was two years, but it's five years now. And uh, any loans made after June 5th, like I said, you can go back and, and, and extend it to the five year coverage. The when, the when the business owners got the loans, for some of you that may be on the call that were able to get it the first time, you could do eight weeks in the, in the beginning or 24 weeks after the 5th of June. You, so you make your decision of how long you want the funds to last. And it would be wise to try to make sure to, to do your calculations correctly so that you could have enough money to make it. And of course, everyone didn't do that. And this is why in our area, I've seen quite a few businesses when I do get out and ride around, or if I'm going to the other side of town to play me around the golf or something like that, I may see some businesses that, that we used to frequent that are no longer in business because they just couldn't sustain after that August deadline of getting the money. And then when they did, if they did get some money in the beginning, they didn't get enough to carry them all the way through to the end of December. And of course, our great Congress as they are, in May, the, the House started putting forth some other funding packages to try to get money into the hands of the business owners because they foresaw that, that, that we were not going to have enough money to go to the end. And they started playing politics because it was an election year, of course, and, and certain constituencies didn't want small businesses to have any more money because they start thinking about the debt and in all of this stuff, they all, all of a sudden got a conscience. Oh no, we can't, we got to worry about the debt now. That held up the money for a long time. So after the election, okay, now whoever's in is in, whoever's out is out. Okay, we can go ahead and put some money back into the hands of the people now. And that's what they're doing. They weren't, it, of course, they still wrestled about how big the package was going to be. And the new administration was saying all the time that the package is not big enough what you're trying to negotiate. So we'll just do a down payment now. And this is what this one is supposed to be, a down payment now for the, and, and a new round of PPP spending. And of course, we start the politics again. So Congress is now working on another bill, $1.9 trillion to try to get even more money into the hands of small businesses and other COVID relief type efforts as we go forward. And, and some of it has to do with trying to get the shots and get everybody their shots as well, trying to beef up that as, as well. So quite a bit going on and, and, uh, and I hope hopefully we can get them to work together. Now, when you're seeking forgiveness, there's some things that you have to be concerned about. And these are the places that you can put your money to make sure you get maximum, maximum forgiveness. Okay, for sure, payroll costs. You can also look at, of course, all your Social Security, Medicare, federal employment. It doesn't, doesn't include that stuff, not the company's portion. It includes the employee's portion, but not the company's portion. Okay, but health benefits, dental, vision, all these type things. Interest on, on mortgage obligations, if you're buying a building or something like that, if your, your rent is covered in there, utilities, and then they got gas, water, and electric, but, but you have to be careful. If you're a transportation company, seek the law, look up the law to see how it applies to you because not all transportation is covered, but it does cover some transportation costs, but you have to go deeper into the system to see if you'll qualify for it if you're some type of transportation company. So these are the basic forgiveness rules. And if you put at least 40% of the money toward these type things, and then the other 60% goes toward your payroll and any payroll expenses that you might have, then you can get full forgiveness. And it, it's, a, it, it's a loan, a 1% loan. It's a very low percentage rate anyway. But still, if you can get it and it's free money, who wouldn't want that? I mean, all of us, I believe, would want to have the free money, okay? If I go on into the, to the rules, continue into the rules, like I said, you have to provide justification at some point. Some of these loans or forgiven loans as they may be in the future, because some of you still may be negotiating and going through that process if you were able to get it the first time. 
whether it's eight or 24 weeks, you must show documentation. What do I mean by documentation? Well, you definitely want to have rosters of your payroll before COVID-19, before all the money started flowing for COVID-19. And you want to show all of your documentation of your payroll and your employees afterwards. You want to make sure to have all of that documentation. You want to have all of your applications and everything. If you did your, your, your taxes already, you make sure you keep, keep all of your documents close by because at some time, somebody may want to sit down with you and talk about how you what you received, how you used the funds, and you want to make sure to have your documentation. Okay. SBA and that whole program, they have a way of, of, of auditing some of it, but they can't get to everything. So, so the process runs like this. You go to your Mr. Lender and you say, hey, I want to, I want to go, since we, I'm banking with you, I want to get a PPP. You sit down and do the application up and everything. Then the bankers are going to take that information. They're going to get it to the SBA. The SBA is going to take a look at it because it is a 7A program run by the SBA. A lot of the 7A loans are they're looking at it under this program right now. So they go back there and they kind of take a look at it. Typically, the way they were doing business, if it was $150,000 or less, then they went ahead and, and let the people have it and not a real deep dive when it come to auditing. But if it was those bigger loans, you know, you're going for $400,000, $500,000, a million dollars because you want to keep a business going. You're pretty big, even though you're a small business, then you might have to worry about a serious audit looking at deep dive at the SBA level. And it might take a little longer to get the funds, but you still could get it. Either way, make sure you keep all of your documentation because you will probably see this info. You need that information again. And I will say, have to be patient, even with this round that we're going into now, there's a lot of people flooding applications into the system. And there's a lot of, of extra work that the SBA has to do, that the bankers have to do. So be a little patient, but do keep in contact with your banker. And also the legislation. You always have to let the legislation catch up. And, uh, and so be watching sba.gov, be watching ppp.gov, whatever you can find to try to track the legislation, do a deep dive and try to find out what's going on with that leg legislation because it's always changing. And right now they, they went slow enough this time that, that nobody's panicking from what I've observed. I was on a SBA call last week with a bunch of lenders as well. And the lenders were not panicking this time around. They were, they were calm. They were not, they were, they were pretty much had more focus when it comes to how they were going to get the money into the hands of the, of the business owners. So that was good to see when I was on that call. That kind of is kind of an overview of what we did in in 2020 and, and, and what's necessary in order to make sure that we get the funding. And right now, still, there are probably some of you, if you're on the call and you were able to receive the first draw in back in 2020, you may still be negotiating some of the fact of how you're going to get the application for forgiveness and all that. They probably hadn't finished all that with you yet because you can defer it for 10 months. And then, but if you're going through that, that's fine this still opens up a new round for us. So where are we today? We're looking at the first draw, we're looking at the second draw and just basics on PPP loan forgiveness. That's what we're gonna dive into right now. But I will pause right now and I'll just see if Ms. Roxana has any, any questions that, that you guys have put forth already. If not, we'll, I'll continue on. No questions, very good. Okay. No, we don't have any. Okay, we will continue on. Very good. I just wanted to make sure. So did you receive the PPP funding in 2020? Did you take the EIDL advance up to $10,000 in some cases? These are questions that whenever I'm on these other calls, these are questions that SBA wants to know whenever, whenever you, your application goes in, they want to know first, did you get the first round of funding? Did you take the EIDL? Because the, the way 2020 was, if you took that EIDL advance, whenever you get the new round, whenever you would get the PPP loan or application in, 
if you got ten thousand dollars and you were trying to get a hundred thousand dollars for PPP, then you really got ninety thousand because they're going to take that ten thousand away. Well, SBA is working on that now. They're trying to get rid of that that part, and and I'll talk about it a little bit later. But it's in the guidance as well. You can look it up. They're they're trying to work on issues to take take care of that that little discrepancy where the ten thousand. So they want to make it so that if you get if you're seeking a hundred thousand dollar loan, they want you to get the hundred thousand dollars. So they're doing internally to try to get rid of that ten thousand dollar discredit that was a that was a advance in the beginning and the sba says with all the businesses this is what they said on the call the other day with all the businesses that apply up to 80 percent of the payroll in the small business world was helped by the ppp and eidl so it was very effective for doing what they wanted to do they didn't just throw the money out there and it didn't get used for what it needed to be used for in the small business community. So I, I was glad to hear that. I was glad to read that in the documentation as well. They're putting it in writing, it, it must be true. And please excuse me, I, I do have a serious allergy day going on. I'm hoping this northerly wind will <laughs> go away from us, but it's beating me up right now. So let's take a look at the, the first draw rules. And this, this come about because like I said, they closed the other program off, it ended December 31st, 2020. And then they start, they got the money through and it's the 27th of December, they got the, the paperwork through and the legislation and all that stuff. And now they gotta look at how we're gonna start flowing money back into the community, okay? So they said, okay, first draws. If this is your first draw, you didn't do anything back in 2020, but you see the need to do it now. You said, okay, I still want to keep doing business. I want to get keep my staff going, so I'm going to try it. Same thing. The, the, the money is authorized for payments for payroll costs, mortgage interest, rent, utilities, all kinds of protection when it comes to PPD and things like that if you have to buy it for your company. Property damage, if you were in a, in a community where you had some rioting and looting and things like that, they'll pay for that too. The first draws were able to apply starting January 11th and they can draw all the way to March 31st. The same rates are applicable, 1%. The maturity prior to June 1st was two years, afterwards is five years. So we're looking at five years right now and you got eight to 24 weeks. I would personally, if I was doing it, I'd try to get the 24 weeks if I could. No collateral and you don't have to do personal guarantees and the government or the, the government nor regular bankers should charge you any kind of fees for doing this. Okay, that's what the first draw rules are. Who can qualify? Well, sole proprietors, a lot of people like to hear that. Independent contractors, self-employed persons. Any small business recognized by the SBA can get this money. Even some of the 501c3s, I, even on the call, they don't have it on their website yet, but they even said 501c6s were available to get the money too. And those are the chambers of commerce. They mentioned that on the call, they had a big discussion about that. And they thought that since these organizations are out there trying to help people that they should be allowed to get some of this money to keep their business, to keep their operation going too. And excuse me for a misspelled word there. That's what happens when you do it yourself. <laughs> it's nonprofits or 501c3 nonprofits, not knobs. But uh, it, businesses with less than, than 500 employees, and then if it's above 500 employees, it must meet the industry, industry size within the SBA NAICS codes and how, they, how it's set up in that. And so then you have to do a deeper dive. And then they added, this is something new. They, they made it sure to add NAICS codes beginning with 72 because now you're looking at accommodations and food service type people. They wanted to make sure to put a lot of the money this time toward restaurants and businesses that deal with accommodations and things like that because these businesses, it seemed, were left out a little bit in the last time around it. Or maybe they saw by looking at the audience that they didn't get enough money into it, but they want to make sure that they identify funds for the code for 7200 if you're dealing with accommodation and food service. So if that's you, do a deep dive and try to take a look into that 
and see what what would apply to you and and seek further guidance from either the SBA or mile one if, if you can have them to do the research for you or Roxana will be happy to do research as well so just just use your use your resources <laughs> okay that's first draw and then when we look at second draw second draw basically is going to be about the same as but except they gave a few days for the first for the first draw applicants to get their applications in and then on the 13th of of January, they opened it up for the second draw people that had already received funding the first time around. So same thing, you, you have to use it for the same thing you use the first draw for. You're still looking at that 60%, you're still looking at the 40%, and, and your same long terms, 1%. But they did go and set aside 25 billion for second draw organizations that have up to 10 employees. They wanted to make sure there was some money there for the true small businesses. And so they have a 25 billion set for that. And that's that's quite a few businesses in that in that category. So 25 billion may not be enough, but at least there's something identified to go right to that source, to those really small businesses. And hopefully that will hit a lot of our minority owned businesses as well. Of course, the maximum loan amount is, again, is $2, $2 million. And when you're trying to do your calculations, make sure you try to calculate it out at the 2.5% times your monthly average when you're looking at a, a, a month from month to month from 2019 to 2020. You can pick your choice. If you want 19, or if you want 20, whichever one you want. But you can't look at one or you can't look at both. You got to take one or the other the way the, way the bankers the way SBA was explaining it last week when I was on that call. If you're in those next codes that I was talking about, the 7,200, you can look at three and a half times your monthly average when you're looking at 2019 or 2020. So that you can get a little more if you're in that industry. Okay, once again, no correct collateral, no personal guarantees and no fees from the lending source, okay? That's uh, on that. Now, when we take a look at the lending forgiveness rules, they're pretty set in stone and they both apply the same for the first draw and the second draw. When you get this money, you cannot go out and reduce your payroll or let your people go. You can't start laying people off so that you can go get that Maserati you've been looking at for the last 10 years. You can't do that. You have to keep your people employed and the money has to go toward payroll expenses or other expenses as authorized in the in the in the guidance okay 60 percent has to be spent on payroll and it's the same thing with the second draw okay when i talked about that loan forgiveness and i'm coming to an end here very quickly when, because we wanted to do just an overview for today and then we'll get deeper into some of the documents tomorrow a little bit but when you're looking at EIDL, the, the reductions, I told you they've removed it from the PPP 2021. SBA is working to correct that advance issue when you got that EIDL advance. There should be no tax implications, but I will caution you, make sure when you're getting your taxes done this year for the 2020 season, make sure you have this conversation with your CPA or your accountant whoever's doing your taxes and, and make sure, hey, let's look it up. Let's look up the guidance in the IRS tax code to see if they put anything in there about PPP or EIDL because they're responsible, you and, and the CPAs are responsible for making sure that your documents are accurate when you submit them to the IRS. And once again, 60% used on payroll issues, 40% on other business expenses. What do we need to do now? Well, number one, you need to talk to your banker or your lender or some other lending source. You can go on sba.gov slash PPP and take a look at the list. Now, some of the list might be changing a little bit because as of last week, they still had not updated the list with all of the participating people right now. They're trying to get more people to participate so more of the money gets into the smaller communities. They actually said that on the call. 
I was on a call with our SBA office here in, in San Antonio, but I was on a call with the SBA district office in Washington, D.C. as well. And all of them are saying they're trying to get the money into the hands of the smaller banks and that the, the list may not be 100% complete right now. So if you have a lender in, in mind, reach out to them and ask them if they're participating. If they're participating, sit down with them and, and, get the, and try to get you an application in. As we said before now, you have until March 31st, 2021, but don't wait till the last minute. And I always say, we do as, a, as an organization, we always say, seek assistance from all your community resources. You don't have to choose one over the other. Use all of us because all of us may have a little different level of experience with dealing with some of these issues that you might have as a business owner. So seek your SBA district office or your local SBA office, your small business development centers. Mile One is there for you. They, they're working hard trying to make sure that you're doing that they're doing what you need them to do in the community and our mbda office we work trying to we'll talk to anybody trust me trust me we'll talk to anybody so if you have some things you want us to work on put us to work and then there's the score organization who is there to help people start businesses but score is also there to help people expand their businesses so they do have some accountants usually in those offices and they can talk to you about some of this stuff so for today, that's pretty much what I had to talk about. And I, if, uh, if any questions that I may be able to ask or any que answer or any questions that Cesar might be able to answer or Miss Roxana, I'll open up the floor right now and we can do that. But I wanna say thank you very much again, Luis and, and Cesar and Roxana for, for putting this on and, and, and getting me in front of this group. I've really enjoyed doing it. I was a little nervous and I, and I do presentations all the time, but I actually enjoyed doing it and I look forward to tomorrow. I can't believe that you say that, how you are doing this all the time. You are a professor. I, I can't believe that you are saying that, but anyway. Okay, we have a couple of questions. Uh, how we have a question in Spanish. Um, I'm going to read the question in Spanish and then I'm going to ask you, asking you the question in English. Okay. It, um, si no tengo empleados porque soy la dueña, la que hace producción, entrega, etcétera, cómo justifico eh, para aplicar al, al PPP. Entonces, uh, the question is, if I don't have any employees, I guess she's a sole proprietor uh -huh. and because she's the owner, she's who does the production, she's who probably does the deliveries. So she's asking how she's going to support in the documentation, I mean, to, to the application for this uh, PPP loan? Well, all of the, that's, a, that's always a good question. And I, I see that question quite a bit. The, the one thing they say you, you need to have as a sole proprietor, you're supposed to have your business and at least one employee is what they're saying when you're a sole proprietor. You're supposed to be, go ahead. So, um, Jackie, él está diciendo que eh, para que él ha visto esta pregunta muy frecuentemente, es lo que más preguntan. Eh, y está diciendo que, ah, que por lo menos siendo como sole proprietor o siendo solamente tú la dueña del negocio, por lo menos deberías tener un empleado. Keep going. Yeah, they, they have at least one employee. And then what you do, you, you got to just, it, no matter what you, if you're doing it on an Excel spreadsheet or if you're doing it with a, with a, a what do you call a, a bookkeeper, get a, a formal document where you're tracking payroll. Always have a formal document where you're tracking payroll. Eh, Jackie, también está diciendo que por lo menos deberías tener eh, en una hoja de Excel todos los gastos que estés teniendo. Eh, yo he leído también un poco acerca de cuando eres sole proprietor, porque yo también soy un business owner y también tengo mi propia empresa y también soy una persona, eh, estoy en bajo esa categoría como sole proprietor. Entonces, lo que yo también te recomendaría es que tengas, así no tengas empleados, porque yo tampoco tengo empleados, es que tengas en una hoja de Excel todos tus gastos, eh, porque eso también puede servir de soporte, así seas tú la única dueña, así no tengas empleados, eso también te va a servir, porque ellos también están dando dinero a las personas que son, son sole proprietorship. Entonces, trata de tener todos los gastos que tengas, ya sean recibos, eh, y ten todo eh, uniforme, uniforme, ¿cómo se dice? Uniformemente, eh, de pronto, puesto en una hoja de Excel, donde estén todos tus gastos. Eso te va a servir como soporte para justificar en el momento de presentar tu aplicación. 
I saw a question. I, I you probably already saw it. The twenty five percent reduction. You see that I, there, there are two more questions. One is okay. from Arnoldo. Okay. And it say when does when does that eight week or twenty four week period begin? When when the funds are expended is usually what they were saying. Your your clock starts usually when you when you get the approval for that money. Basically, when they expend that money to you. That's that's what they've been telling people that whenever your clock starts, whenever you get the money, and you just track out twenty eight or twenty four weeks, whichever you're doing. Okay, uh, there is another question, and it say, is there a requirement to have a twenty five percent reduction in recipes when comparing two thousand nineteen to twenty twenty to qualify for the second drop? That is a very good question, and that that was a, that was one of the things I didn't want to talk about. So that's one of the components too to the second draw. You must show that you have had a 25% drop either a quarter in 2019 or a month in 2020 or a month in 2019 or a quarter in 2020, however, whichever way you want to do it. But it has to be the same. You can't say, well, I want to look at one month in 2019 in June but I, and so 2020, I'm going to compare July. You can't do that. You got to look at June 2019, June 2020. And, and by the same token, you can't say, well, I'm going to look at the first quarter of 2019 versus the third quarter of 2020. You can't do it that way either. You have to match quarter to quarter or month to month when you're looking at 2019 and 2020. That's the correct way to do that. So that, that was a very good question. Thank you for that question. Um, I'm sorry for the noise in my background. I think somebody's doing the- I can't, I can't hear anything. Okay, cool. Um, and there is another question. I think we already answered that question, but I just want to make sure she, Angela is asking, if we don't have employees or payroll, do we still qualify? So just making sure. Well, see, all of the guidance that I see, and when you look in there, so go to go to sba.gov to make sure or talk to the SBA themselves or the, or the lenders, because all of the guidance I see says that a, a sole proprietor can qualify, but they must have at least one employee other than themselves, because you have to show that you're running payroll for somebody else. And you can, of course, you can include yourself as payroll, but they want you to have yourself and at least one employee. That's that's what they want. That's that's all the guidance I've seen was consistent in that in that question. Oh, okay. I have been reading as well, and I'm I'm pretty sure um, there is an option where you have you can apply, but you need to support that your sales drop like like very bad during the COVID situation. And I think that you can qualify if that happened or if you have a space where you are renting and you can show that you are not obviously able to pay that money, I think you can also apply. So I think what we need to do is probably be updated with whatever happened and all the updates the SBA is providing us so we can be on the loop of whatever is happening. Yeah, with the I, I, is, I, I will say it, it's not going to hurt anybody to apply, but the guidance that I've read says at least one employee okay I, it's not going to hurt you to apply because they may work out something else with you that might be low interest it might not be 100 percent forgiven but they may work out something with you at the lending institution that you have yeah to and i think you will be able to get the money because we have a client and she's in corpus christi she's a so she's actually llc but she doesn't have any employees and she got the ppp the, the first round she got it like she didn't actually apply she just got the money yes yes yeah, but the, the key there was she's an llc uh -huh. that's the key an <laughs> llc can get it but single member llc might get it but if you're a sole proprietor they're saying you, you got to have one one employee but like i said always check with the lender or you can check with SBA as well because I don't I don't know everything I looked at everything I could to try to be as, as prepared as I could for the, for my presentation but I don't okay. I'm not able to find everything because I can't do a deep dive into every one of the rules and the regulations that's why I, I point you to SBA yeah for, for the guidance or the or the lenders yeah and I think it has been a very productive and very helpful information that you provide us today Hal. Honestly, it was an amazing presentation. 
Uh, and, and I think something that I would like to highlight is we are going to have two more series tomorrow and Thursday, and we really encourage you all to be connected with us because this was just an overview about the PPP. And I'm pretty sure if today was good, I'm pretty sure tomorrow and Thursday is going to be much better because I'm, I, I know that Hal is going to be um, providing deep, deepest information about this PPP and information about the law. It's going to be much better tomorrow because I'm going to sign it to Roxana to do the presentation. <laughs> okay, okay. So I don't know if we have any more questions. Um, um, if you have any more questions, please um, send us those questions on the chat and we can um, answer those questions right now. I don't know if you have one too. I see Angela's question there. She, she wanted to know about if she started her business right before the pandemic in 2020. Is she able to, and she can, can she still show, demonstrate sales drop from month to month of that quarter? Now, I know at one point that there was a February something deadline that they had to be in business by February 9th or something like that. Now, with the new guidance, I didn't see anything on it. But if you've been in business since, say, February 15th of 2020, and you can show where you started ascending as far as your receipts, and then all of a sudden you showed a drop at the tail end of 2020, I would sit down and have that conversation with the bank, or I, I would also have that conversation with my, my local SBA office or the, or the district office, whichever it might be. But, but I do know, I, I remember on several of the presentations I was on last year, I do remember something about February. There was, there was a February dead date in there and I, I did not look at that this time. But, but take a look at that and, uh, and, and have the conversation. It's not gonna hurt you to have the conversation with them, okay? Yeah, and I also want to remind everybody as well, uh, if you're needing some guidance, if you're needing some answers to some questions, uh, please reach out to us here at mile one. We'll do our very best to do some research for you and get you some answers. And if we can't find the answer for you, then we'll reach out to our partners and do our very best to connect you with somebody that can help you. That's awesome. exactly right. And very also, cool. and also, just keep in mind the people that are here in this webinar, um, because I know that many people will be asking like where I have to go to start this application. So just make sure. I just want to highlight something that Hal said in the entire presentation go to your direct, uh, direct bank uh, and trying to start over there. The bank that you have been making that relationship with your business, I think is the best uh, probably step to start the process because you already mm -hmm. have been doing this relationship and they know you already. So yeah. that's yeah. my suggestion, go to that's the a, bank. That's a very good suggestion. And, and, I and also, start the process I there. would also add to what you said though, Ms. Roxana, go to sba.gov slash PPP and educate, educate yourself a little bit on it a little bit further before you go and do a deep dive. We, we have some frequently asked questions. I'm gonna warn you, it's 17 pages. We are gonna make it available to you, but it's 17 pages of data and information. So I'm going to, we're gonna make sure to provide it to you but educate yourself as much as you can before you sit down and talk to your banker or before you talk to SBA, because when you, you want them to give you some really good guidance and the better you can educate yourself, the more intelligent your questions will be when you sit down and have the conversation with them. So we will, like I said, we will make this information available to you, the presentation I gave, and we'll make the frequently asked questions available to you. And uh, I want you to just, we want you to wish everybody good blessings and wish everybody has a, a really good opportunity to get these funds to keep your business going. Yeah, and that's, and that's very true. Like for these type of programs that uh, we are probably receiving from the government, from the SBA, whatever, I think we all need to be um, um, educated about these type of things because sometimes we go into the loan, we got the loan, and then we don't know how to do with, like what we are going to do with that money. So it's very important because we have many clients that they received the first PPP and they were calling us, what I'm going to do with that money? I received 20,000 bucks in my bank account. I don't know what to do. So please, trying to be updated with the information, the SBA is providing a lot of information about the, the loans. 
on trying to educate yourself about this PPP or EIDL. So you are going to know what you are going to be into because many people don't know about that. So please, please do that and join us tomorrow and Thursday. This is very helpful information. And if you have any other resources, any other webinars where you can get this type of information, do it, apply and participate. This is very important for your business. Excellent. Hal, Roxana, thank you so much for your time and your information and resources. We greatly appreciate it. Don't forget, guys, we have part two tomorrow on Wednesday and part three as well on Thursday. Uh, please go to our uh, link to sign up for the register and register for the webinars. Uh, I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Please do not forget you are not alone. There is assistance out there. Please look for it, find it, call mile one, reach out to, to the uh, MBDA, uh, take advantage of these opportunities to make sure that your business uh, continues to grow and sustain through this pandemic. Thank you very much once again. Everyone have a wonderful day and we will see you all tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you guys. See you tomorrow.